welcome everybody to this event, Academics and Ac Advocates, How Can Research and Refugee Action Inform Each Other in, in Sussex? So a little bit of housekeeping just before we start. We're going to be going on until about 7.30 today. If you need to go before that, obviously there's um, the exit and emergency exits there. I also just need to let you know that we are live streaming this on the IDS website and on Facebook. Um, so this is a, a public event. So just to let you know that anything you say um, in this forum will also be in that forum. So just, just so that you're forewarned. So my name is Jodie Harris. Uh, I'm a researcher here at IDS, the Institute of Development Studies. I'm, I'm also chair of trustees of LOSRAS, uh, the Lewis Organization in Support of Refugees and Asylum Seekers. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about both organizations in a moment for those of you who, who aren't familiar with either one or the other. Um, but every few months, LOSRAS hosts an open meeting for our members uh, looking at different refugee and asylum issues. So this time I'm wearing both hats, my LOSRAS hat uh, and my IDS hat, to bring together academics and advocates. And in many cases, obviously, the people who are speaking today are both, uh, both academics and, and advocates and activists. Um, but we want to explore the linkages between those two worlds um, locally here in, in Sussex. So that's the, the plan for today. Um, so just uh, before I tell you about the event this evening, I want to let you know about other events that are coming up locally. Um, so on the right is Refugee Week, um, which happens every year, and this year is June 17th to 21st. And I know there are lots of different uh, activities happening um, in Lewis and Brighton related to this that you can find online. Um, but just to flag that, that that is happening, coming up very soon. Um, and then on the left is an event called Refugee Tales. It's a walk in solidarity with refugees and asylum seekers and, and immigration detainees. Um, and it's a, it's a five-day walk that happens every year. Uh, and uh, at the lunchtimes and evenings are events and readings uh, on refugee issues. And this year it happens to be in Sussex. Um, so it starts in Brighton uh, on the uh, morning of the 6th. Um, and the first night will be in Lewis. So we have uh, an event in Lewis. Lewis. Brighton, Brighton Meeting House. Brighton Meeting House. Okay, so before the walk starts, Brighton Meeting House Friday night. And then on the Saturday, the walk starts, and that night will be in Lewis. And then it will go on uh, to Eastbourne. Um, so there are uh, flyers on this table here um, about that, both the refugee tales and the event in Lewis. Um, and if I've missed anything, Sylvia, you can tell everybody later when we get to the, the Q&A. Um, there's also a very local event, a plant sale happening in Lewis uh, in aid of Lodzras um, on May the 18th, so very, very soon. So if anyone wants to get involved in that, uh, you can do so through our website, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. So if any of the talks today inspire you, um, you can get involved in various different ways uh, through these different things things. So LOSRAS, the Lewis Organization in Support of Refugees and Asylum Seekers, which we usually abbreviate to Lewis Refugee Support, um, I know not everybody is, is familiar with here. So LOSRAS is a, a local charity. We work in the Lewis district, so not just Lewis town. Um, uh, and we aim to promote the welfare of refugees and asylum seekers uh, through raising awareness of refugee and asylum issues, both locally and nationally, um, by providing practical help to refugees and asylum seekers locally um, and by advocating and lobbying to improve the rights of, of refugees and asylum seekers. So in particular we have two uh, active campaigns. We are advocating for an end to the use of indefinite immigration detention in the UK and that's uh, largely in collaboration with uh, Gatwick Detainees Ref uh, Welfare Group and Refugee Tales um, And because the, the UK is the only EU country now which still has unlimited immigration detention. Uh, we also advocate for the safe passage of refugees and especially unaccompanied child refugees uh, for resettlement in the UK through the various routes that exist um, in collaboration with uh, the national campaigns group Safe Passage. 
Um, we also have a couple of main areas of, of very practical work. So we have a befriending and support program for families who are resettled in the Lewis district, largely under, uh, largely resettled from refugee camps around Syria. Um, and we also have a program of work in schools to educate year eight children on refugee and asylum issues as part of their personal and social education classes. So we do all of that through volunteers. There are no paid staff uh, at LOSRAS. There are 10 committee members, including the trustees, uh, around 30 volunteer befrienders, um, and around 150 members. Many of you today uh, are LOSRAS members, um, and obviously everybody gets involved at different points in different ways. So more information on all of that, if you're interested, is available on our brand new shiny website. Um, and I also just want to introduce IDS, the Institute of Development Studies, because I know um, that many of you here have come you know, from Lewis through LOSRAS, so I just wanted to let you know a little bit about what IDS does. So IDS is a global research and learning organization. We work for equitable and sustainable change in society. Um, and IDS was awarded first place in, in a ranking of development studies research organizations worldwide again this year, which is very nice. Um, so our 2015 to 2020 2020 strategy, which is obviously almost coming to an end, but is underpinned by three main challenges. So reducing inequalities, accelerating sustainability, and building inclusive and secure societies. So all very relevant to refugee and asylum issues. And we do that through uh, what we call engaged excellence, an engaged excellence approach, which means that the quality and impact of our work depends on us collaborating with governments, with NGOs, with local civil society, with citizens groups um, and lots of others to achieve positive change which is strategically informed by the research and, and knowledge that, that we produce. Um, and again, the IDS website is there and we do have uh, a, a fairly significant stream of work on migration and displacement. Um, so this sort of engaged excellence is, is really what this evening's all about. We've brought together a really great set of, of academics and advocates and activists to talk to you about their work. Um, so we have Dolph Talentello, who's a research fellow here at IDS, and he'll be talking about his research in Lebanon. Um, and then we're going to go to Elisa Sandri, who was formerly at the University of Sussex. She's very much involved with hummingbirds in Brighton now, and she's going to talk to us about her work in Calais. Then we're going to go to Mark, Mark Deutsch, who's a senior research fellow at the University of Brighton and also involved with hummingbirds and sanctuary on sea. And he's going to talk to us about his research in Brighton, so getting even closer to home. Um, and we're also very lucky to have Laura Sinan here, who's a trustee at Voices in Exile, um, and so, uh, but also has a background in, in social science research at, uh, uh, at Brighton University. Um, so the idea is that each of our three academics will have about 10 minutes to, to tell you about their research, moving from Lebanon to Calais to Brighton. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion among the academics and, uh, and advocates um, and thinking about useful links between the two and seeing you know, which hats people wear when they respond to those questions. Um, and then we invite the audience um, to ask questions and, and join the debate until, until the end. So, with no further ado, let's move on to the to the first uh, speaker. That's Dolph Talentello, um, speaking to us about his work in in Lebanon. Thank you very much, very much, Jeremy. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all here tonight. Um, these kind of events don't happen perhaps often enough yet. Um, bringing people from nearby the university to IDS, but the, I hope this is going to be uh, the first one in a long series of engagement, particularly on this important topic. Um, there's, a history, uh, there's quite a long and, and strong history of IDS working on issues around refugee displacement, and currently I'm one of the people who are involved in this work. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick insight in, in some of the work that we are doing um, in Lebanon and Jordan. Um, I also work in, uh, in, in different contexts, including in India, uh, currently some work going on in Finland, Norway and the UK, we're starting as well. Um, my interest uh, as a fellow at the IDS uh, is in issues around cities, in which ways is displacement in uh, and of 
populations within cities and people coming to cities different. Now the classic, the classic situation of course in terms of refugees sort of hosting and support and providing protection has been organized around camps. Um, this is how people often still tend to think about um, the, the first response for refugees. Um, but we also know by now very well that uh, the great majority of refugees, particularly when they are displaced for longer periods of time, and some of the UN figures are showing us that we're now on average looking, particularly in situations of conflict, uh, at periods of displacement which are exceeding two decades, people end up living in cities. Um, and this is happening side by side with uh, world or world level globalization trends. As you may be aware um, already, of course, um, global population, uh, right now more than half of the global population is located in cities. And this process is still accelerated in many, uh, accelerating in many, many countries. So we're trying to understand through our research in what ways uh, is the experience of refugees and displaced populations different in, in urban conditions. Uh, and this is based on, on the notion that cities are much more complex in terms of uh, provisioning of services, in terms of the actors or the organizations that are involved in, in providing support or not providing support, that broker access to facilities, to housing, um, to um, education, to healthcare uh, facilities, etc. Now, the discussion sort of that I wanted to highlight is, is about our work in, in, in Lebanon and Jordan. And just a very quick piece for those of you who are not aware, um, these countries are, are currently hosting still a, a very large number of, of Syrian refugees. Um, Lebanon has a population of about 4 million uh, Lebanese people uh, and about sort of 1 million Syrians. Um, just in comparison, the UK it has, has agreed to, to host 20,000 Syrians over a five-year period of time. Um, so, now, we also know that the great majority of these people are actually living in cities, so over 80% uh, are some of the estimates that are being used. In Turkey, similarly, Turkey is hosting two and a half to three million Syrians, 90% plus is living, uh, living in cities. So rather than me doing most of the talking, I, I thought it might be interesting to give an insight in, in the voices and the perspectives of the communities that we work with. Um, and I'm going to show you a video which has been produced through participatory video me uh, methods. Um, IDS is perhaps to some of you well known for its history in developing uh, participatory research methods. That means working closely with communities um, where researchers with communities jointly produce insights and, and new knowledge into the issues at hand. And we worked with a local women's group in a, in a densely populated uh, inner city area in Beirut. And I'm going to show you um, some of the findings. And the question that we were exploring were around well-being. What does it mean to live well in cities as a refugee, as a displaced uh, person, uh, under great amount of stress? And, and we, we thought it would be very interesting to have perspectives both from local host populations, uh, the Lebanese, as well as from as well as from, from uh, the refugee population. This was only a small part of this, this research project, but I don't have the time to sort of, uh, sort of discuss most of it, but I'd be very happy to have a follow-up discussion. So without, without further ado, I would like to show you this video. Uh, and نحن هلا مش عايشين نفسيا ما بتفوت على بيت لبناني وعنده نفسيه مرتاحه ابدا من شغل من اولاد من امان ابدا هذا الشيء معنا اياه كمان التغيرات القصه الحد السريع بعد الصراع 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 الحد عملت ايه تغير كثير كبير لانه صار نسبه النزوح اكبر بكثير من القاعدين بالمنطقه هيدا شكل عبء بس هن بالنهايه ما زعمهم واللبنانيين كمان ما زعمهم ضغط كثافه السكان كله تاثر بالمحيط اللي حواليه انه في عدد كثير من السكان الزباله زادت اجارات البيوت غليت البيوت صار في زحمه حتى المي صار في شح بالماي ضغط 
لانه صار عندنا كثير كثافه بالمنطقه واجهرات كثير غاليه نحن ما بنقدر يعني لبنان شو بده يلحق لا يلحق ما بقدر ما انت قاعد بهالبلد انت مدير عندك نحن ما يضط حدا نحن ما ضط حدا نحن مع كل الناس لكل نازح لكل سوري فلسطيني فاصير عنا 790 سنه ما هي ما ضد بس لما بتيجي انت ضغط عليك وشي زياده عن وضعك اللي انت فيه ايش تحمل ولا شيء انت مردين انت بكفوك يا خيك مو سبع اولاد تستقبل قد ما فيك مش ضد حدا نحن لا ضد السوري ولا ضد فلسطين ولا ضد حدا نحن بهالبلد اللبنانيه بدنا كل الناس نتعاطى بالوضع اللي فينا نتحمله مظلومين اثنين مظلومين لانه اجارات البيوت عم تتغلى على السوريين عم بيستغلوهم في صمصره انا بعتبرهم هودي مافيات هودي ما بخافوا الله يجي يعني يصيروا ياخذوا مصاري سمسره من الناس والبيوت ما بتنسكن غير صحيه فهيدا اثر على لبناني بطل اللي عنده فرص عمل ما بقى في عنده بيت فتركوا كم محل في هون؟ في ثلاثه خمسه بنانيه من 100 محل في ثلاثه او اربع بنانيه لا أخسر لا 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 اجت بقول لك في نظافه ما يفهم. بنتين شابين وبشتغل بكوافيا. أه مرحبا كيفكم وهيك وهيك سافا ما بعرف شو. يوم تلاسول بس كنتوا طالبين حاطين اعلان انه بدكم برشور. انا قلت لك شو بتعرفي ما بتعرفي؟ قلت لها شو بعرف وهيك. شوي ولا بتقلي اوكي فيك تبلشي بكره. اوكي ميرسي ميرسي حملت حالي فلاي انبسطت واو كثير يعني. الزبونه عرفت امس رحت خبرتها تحت المحل امس قالت لي سوري انه انت سوريه حضرتك قلت لها قالت لي سوريه نحن ما شغاله هون. في عدم بيت ما في امن بس في امن بس الضغط بس دور لبنان بدي بدي بطلع في النهايه هذا بدي اخذه ساعتها كل واحد فاهم يتخبى. من اول ما صار الحرب من ست سنين لهلا انا هون. في مشكله. وخصوصا بعد ما عملوا الاقامات عملوا الكفيل هلا نحن فايتين عادي نظامي بس منا ما عندنا كفيل لبناني وما عندنا امكانيه ندفع ال 600 دولار لحتى نروح نعمل اوراق انا رجع على سوريا مثلا ما فيني ارجع ولا ممكن اني ارجع انا عم بحلم وعم فكر وعم بعمل كل الضغوطات لحتى اطلع برات البلد لانه لهالبلد البلد عم بقدر اتعايش معه من الغلا اللي موجود فيه ومن ظروف الحياه اللي انا هون عم اعاني منها أنا أهم شيء أخذ مني يعني ريح ولادي مش قادرة وغير وغير يعني عم نبرم وسخ هون جاي هون الضغط كثير عم بيعمل الأشياء عم تتعبنا ضغط السكن بس اثنيناتهم ضحايا وعم بشتغل على هذا الموضوع شكلنا مجموعة من الصبايا السوريين ومن اللبنانية عم بيشتغلوا كلهم بالمنطقة يعني عم بي عم بفرجوا الصبايا السوريين انه نحن عايشين كمان عم نفيد المنطقه عم عم نشتغل مثل مثل اي لبناني موجود بالمنطقه لخدمه المنطقه وكله عمل تطوع، هيدا انجاز كمان اللي بفتخر فيه بحب بحب زيد ايه بحب زيد انه نحن الكل الموجودين انا منهم في نحن ناس من حس من رجع من تألم من لحم ودم بشر يعني نستاهل كل الخير اه يا ريت حدا يعني تجي من الجمعيات اللي عم تجي عم تجي كثير جمعيات هون تشوف العالم شو بدها، يعني ما تعمل مشاريع تطبقها هي وقاعده بمكاتبها والاي سي وتقول وتقول اه هن هيدي المعايير انحطت فرش الصوره الحقيقيه للبناني، صوره الشخص المضياف اللي بيرحب باي شخص غريب اللي بيفتح بيته للغرباء اللي طول عمره هذا هو اللبناني المفروض نفرج الوجه الحلو الوجه المنيح نكون متعاطفين نكون متعاونين نكون عادي يعني 
انه لانه نحن شعب جربنا نحن وصار فينا اللي صار يعني ما المفروض انه حاسس اللي جاي لعندي نازح انه انت لا غريب وقاعد هون وكذا لا المفروض نكون تعايش نعيش مع بعضنا بحريه بكرامه بالفه نحن بشر تحت سما واحده ما في فرق ما في المفروض تشيلوا هيدي الطائفيه تشيلوا الحساسيه عاملني كانسان ما تعاملني شو انا شو خلفيتي شو طايفتي شو مذهبي ما حدا ما حدا يحاسبني انا شو عندي حاسبني انا كيف معك نحن تحت سما واحده I just wanted to show the movie because it's, it, it really illustrates the pressure under which these cities are under, the people who live there, and, and people are really having, having all kinds of dilemmas, trying to square their, sort of their moral consciousness of trying to provide support with the everyday pressures. Can I afford living in my town because the housing prices have gone up by four times over the last three, four years? Um, yes, I'd like to support sort of the Syrian refugees. But how much longer? Um, yes, we have many people in our neighborhood, but uh, we're concerned about the safety on the streets. There's a lot of people are running around that we don't know. So there are a lot of, a lot of um, quite contrasting experience that people are, are conveying through these kind of exercises. Uh, and they relate these to the way in which public policy works, the law tries to regulate the Syrians, um, etc. Thank you. Great, so from Lebanon, um, let's go to, to Calais. Um, <coughs> oh, with my notes. There we go. Thanks, Thanks Elisa. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thanks everyone, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, so I am here to present my research um, that I conducted in Calais with volunteers uh, between 2015 and 2016. Um, it's a little bit hard to separate the two hats between activism and academia, but I'll try my best. Um, so. I thought I would give um, an overview of uh, the Django in Calais, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Django. Um, so the Django was one of the biggest um, informal refugee settlements in the area of Calais. Um, there were a lot of other um, um, informal settlement, settlements around the area, but the Django was the most, the biggest one. And in 2016, just before um, the camp was evicted, there were about 10,000 people living there. Um, despite these big numbers, there wasn't any um, formal humanitarian aid um, delivered to the refugees. MSF, um, Doctors Without Borders and Doctors of the World, were um, the only two humanitarian organizations that intermittently worked in the camp. Um, as you can imagine, with um, so many uh, people living um, on a wasteland, um, standard um, hygienic conditions were extremely poor. Um, there was no food um, dispatched uh, regularly um, to, the, to the refugees living there, um, and only grassroots organizations and charity were providing um, this sort of support. Um, but as well as um, a lack of infrastructure, there was also a lack of safeguarding measures. So many um, miners went missing, um, volunteers were aware of prostitution rackets inside the camps, um, and also some uh, criminal gangs moved um, to the jungle to exploit refugees. So, as I said, um, there were 
hundreds of volunteers um, working in the camp. Um, and uh, despite the informality of this humanitarian aid, volunteers managed to provide um, to establish very good networks of, of aid. And a lot of the grassroots organizations were from the UK, but also there were volunteers coming from all, all over Europe. Um, so I, apart from volunteers, there were um, also refugees helped um, to um, contribute to um, some of the infrastructure in the camp. For example, here you can see um, one of the churches that will, was built uh, by refugees. And um, refugees in general contributed to um, the livelihood of the camp by setting up cafes, restaurants, barber shops, and so on. Um, refugee volunteers also helped uh, grassroots organizations in building infrastructure. They protected vulnerable um, people in the camp. They were translators and guardians of the infrastructures when uh, the grassroots organizations weren't present in the camp. Um, so I myself was a volunteer in Calais and I started going to um, Calais with uh, a hummingbird, gra um, a Brighton grassroots organization, now charity, the Hummingbird Project. And at the time, um, we used to provide medical aid in the camp. Um, when we first started, we provided donations, like uh, such as uh, sleeping bags, tents, um, clothes. And then very quickly, the uh, volunteers started to realize that um, there was a big need of medical aid, and therefore that um, the, the services developed into um, medical provision, and doctors and nurses you started to go to the camp um, to the hummingbird clinic um, shortly after that period of time um, MSF started to operate in the camp and so the hummingbird project realized that really there wasn't any need anymore for a medical clinic and the services once again developed into providing a safe space for the young people living in the camp. Um, there was also um, always ad hoc support when and where was needed. And alongside the services provided in the jungle, the Hummingbird Project also did a lot of work um, in the UK uh, with advocacy and with awareness raising for um, the rights of refugees in Calais and in general in Europe. Um, so shortly after I started volunteering, I also realized that um, the, the aid, the informal aid that was provided in the camp was very specific. And I thought it would, and I thought it needed more attention. Um, and I started my research. And so briefly, um, just to describe what uh, my research findings were, is that this um, um, aid that I called volunteer humanitarianism had specific characteristics. For example, it was very close to home. Uh, volunteers could engage with this aid uh, for one day, for a weekend, or for six months. Um, and they could always come home. Um, quickly. And it was also informal. Um, volunteers operated with much less of the bureaucratic structures that normally are around aid or charity. Um, and volunteers also were the majority of volunteers weren't professionals in the f in this field. Uh, they were professionals. They had of, uh, other jobs, so they we, we could say that they were professionals, but not in humanitarian aid. Um, 
also improvisation played a big part um, in volunteer humanitarianism because um, there were a lot of instances where volunteers were trying to deal with some situations as, as they get along. Um, Another part of volunteer humanitarianism that I highlighted in my research was um, soci sociality. This kind of humanitarian aid created significant spaces for sociality among the volunteers and among the volunteers and refugees. Um, and the final, um, the final part of, of volunteer humanitarianism is activism. Activism played an extremely important role um, in this um, work. In fact, um, the majority of grassroots organizations um, in Calais started as um, humanitarian um, organizations, or they, they thought that that was their mission. However, surely, after um, working in the camp, they started to realize that their work had also to be political um, because the conditions in the camp were obviously created by um, political decisions across Europe and in France. So a lot of these um, grassroots organizations and charity started to be at the forefront of activism in the UK and in Europe. And um, they were advocating for refugee protection and they were denouncing violent practices at the border. Um, however, differently from other activist uh, organizations such as No Borders, for example, that were present in the jungle um, before, um, that were present in Cali before the jungle um, st started in 2015. Um, these grassroots organizations always felt that their mission was political, um, that was, their mission was um, humanitarian rather than political. And therefore, they always had to negotiate this double role um, as uh, activists and humanitarian workers. So, um, I, as I said, I conducted research in 2016, uh, 2015 and 2016, but I also wanted to... Um, update to give a brief update on Calais now because the jungle was evicted in 2016 however people are still in Calais there's about 2,000 people there and um, they continue to arrive um, daily um, the conditions, however, are worse uh, for refugees and for volunteers. Um, we know that refugees are um, abused by the police. The, the, the volunteers have reported many instances where refugees have been um, victims of police brutality and volunteers also have been um, arrested in some in instances without um, any um, yeah, without any reason, apparent reason. So um, just as some concluding thoughts, um, in my research uh, situated volunteer humanitarianism at the crossroads of activism, um, humanitarianism, and uh, volunteerism. And I just want to conclude with a thought that um, given the current situation in, in Calais, and this is still going on, um, it, is urgent, it is urgent to find a long-lasting solution um, and guarantee that human rights are upheld um, in Calais and prevent the continuation of this humanitarian crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa. And yeah, showing that really uh, this sort of distinction between activists and academics in many cases is, uh, is not uh, concrete. So, thank you, Mark. Moving on to Brighton.
Okay, thanks very much, Jay. Thanks very much for coming along. Um, I'm going to sort of follow on that story um, from Elisa and the jungle um, and tell a bit of a story about how I got into thinking about sport and leisure in relation to refugees. Part of this is going to be slightly advocating for the role that sport and leisure should and can play within uh, this particular sector, how we can help people by just doing everyday mundane acts like playing sports or doing leisure activities. So there's a little bit of an argument why we should do this. Um, there's also some ethical considerations about why we actually do some of this research because um, part of through the activism work, as Jenny said, the, these, these lines are quite blurred. Um, it sort of really prompted me as an academic to think about why am I doing these things. And finally, I'll draw on um, two particular research projects that I've been working that I've worked on since 2015 actually and one final thing about bringing this full circle into how we can maybe do some advocacy work through some of the research um, and I sort of start with a story linking the jungle to, to here really because I started volunteering with the Tumming Bird Project and going into that youth safe space and medical centre and realising how humbling it is, not just because of the situation people have, but how actually limited my my skill set is. Basically, all I could do was make cups of tea in the tea room, in the, in the, the tea uh, kitchen, and talk about football. And that was one of the things that I did when we was working in the medical clinic, and I was basically just putting people at their ease, because mainly, mainly young boys and young men. And the one thing we had in common, regardless of the linguistic abilities of people, was uh, football. Who was better, Ronaldo or Messi? Um, and those everyday conversations that take place around the world um, were happening there. And it was just one of those, those moments where it's just that realisation where something about sport or football could could um, change things and the improvisation that Elisa talked about as well one of the ways of how do we think about calming some of the boys down let's go and kick a football around um, in the football picture that being constructed there <coughs> Now, I come from a critical sociological background. I've researched around sport, actually around football fandom. So it's a bit of a shift to what be, I'll talk about in a minute. But I've always been very critical. When I hear policymakers, when I hear politicians, when I hear people in the FA or FIFA talk about the power of football, and so it brings people together, all I've ever done is gone racism, hooliganism, have you never heard of these? <laughs> and then you go and have a personal experience where I'm talking about football when we are coming together. Now, football or sport has no intrinsic um, interest or no intrinsic power, but it's what we, what we put into it. And I start with the words of C.L.R. James, who's talking about cricket. You know, he, he wrote an exceptional book around the history of cricket, but as he sort of uh, utilising uh, Kipling's words around England, you know, what do they know of cricket who only cricket know? If we only think about the actual sport itself, we're missing a whole range of other activities, a whole range of other feelings, emotions, traditions, politics that are imbued within these social activities. C.L.R. James in particular was talking around um, the, the West Indies beating England at cricket, you know, the, the colonial overlords losing at home or losing at you know, the, fit, the home of cricket, but also to a certain extent building their own history. Because you know, he also talks about in this quote that so the English had this sense of themselves through Drake and um, uh, Nelson and Churchill and you know, Dickens and Shakespeare, whereas the colonies didn't have that because the British had imposed themselves on them. So Cricket suddenly became a way of actually creating their history. And if you go to the Caribbean, there'll be lots of statues and roads and roundabouts and buildings named after famous cricketers because they put these, these countries on the map. So, but it's not just about the big politics. It's also about the everyday. I mean, leisure as well as sport are just everyday activities that we do. That often we, uh, particularly around the sort of agar and strang indicators of integration, it's often around things like employment, education, health, and housing. Very much things related to the state and state control. Whereas leisure sports sits outside that. It's much more informal, much more ad hoc, but actually can be quite powerful because it does create that safe space away from that the state. But it also creates an everyday activity, invariably linking someone's past life in their previous home to their new home and in a world that is suddenly turned upside down just being able to sew just being able to play music just being able to play football just being able to play cricket helps you keep that continuity of your sense of self and self-identity 
And this sort of recognizing this sort of challenged my own views as an academic about, okay, why am I doing this? Because, how do I say this? You know, ethics, I've always acted ethically. Ethically, ethics are part of being an academic. But it was, you know, I researched football fans. I was always someone who was very open about the fact that I was a researcher. And as a volunteer in the jungle, suddenly you look around and it was clear that ethics were everywhere. And of course, the fact that it was so informal and ad hoc, as Elisa said, there was no framework that actually protected the volunteers or the, or the, or the people living in the camp. Um, and there's, a, there's a quite a long-standing academic tradition of doing no harm, is that when we do research, we should do no harm. And therefore, that's a, that's a good thing. We've almost left it untouched. But when working particularly with this group of people, how do we know we're not doing harm? Just by talking to them, by interviewing them in a situation where they're probably going to be interviewed a thousand, well, I'm exaggerating, a number of times by the Home Office, by politicians, by media, by other people. There's constantly being, their stories are constantly being forced to be told and to be retold. So why are we doing this? How do we do something? How do we use this information for something better? It has to be beyond do no harm. It actually has to be about actively helping and changing the lives of the people that's actually involved in the research. And this sort of builds on a former colleague of mine at the University of Brighton who talks about sport in particular. He's often, we, we, we uh, sociologists of sport will often talk about, describe the situation, describe the, 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 the problems within sport. But actually we should be seeking to recognize the power dynamics that exist within sport, we only have to look at the sort of top of the FA or the FIFA or the UEFA, the, you know, the national, European and international governing bodies, all white men. There are certain power structures that are in place and we have to actively not just highlight them, but try to work against them and, un and unravel them. And it's when working on the ground that you really get a sense of, okay, this is something that we can do to change people's lives. We can learn about that, but actually we should be feeding that back up through. Um, so one particular project I did with Elisa's help, um, thankfully, um, was with Brighton Table Tennis Club. The Brighton Table Tennis Club is based in Kemp Town. Um, they do lots of outreach. They've been going for 10 years and they um, talked to me about getting some funding from Sport England, the national governing body for sport in England, about how to do a, a refugee integration project. They started doing some work with um, some refugees that were coming through in about 2014, 2015, um, and they very much set themselves up as a community club. They want to be seen as a positive, welcome, inclusive environment. And they, they do many other types of um, you know, table tennis um, projects, uh, working with people with learning, physical disabilities, working with people uh, overcoming cancer, older people, um, LGBT groups, younger people, older people. Um, they're now working in prisons and trying to think about how to link um, physical activity within within a prison and actually a lewis prison seeing the see the link here um, but also then how that can help them integrate them back into society by going to a community club and working or playing playing a sport um, and one of the things that we found particularly at the table tennis club and i think to advocate that okay sport doesn't have any intrinsic power it's actually about the people that do it and the, and the values they imbue. And one of the things about Brighton Table Tennis Club is the active approach they take, and almost to a certain extent to say that maybe sport can do something. It's not, you know, it's not the, the big policy areas. It's not necessarily in you know, the government state area. But sport is a strange place where you have a coach or a referee or an umpire, someone whose role is actively to interfere or intervene in the behaviour of someone else is actively to say that's not the right thing to do. You shouldn't kick a ball that way. Or you shouldn't hit a ball that way. Or actually, your attitude is probably not quite right for the team. And actually, that can work quite well in integration situations like this, because one of the things the table tennis did, club did very well was they took an active role in moving people around. So they didn't just have a refugee team. So no, you're all playing together. And if you two are playing together all the time, 
just because you're friends and you're getting on, well, let's mix it up. So you actually meet other people. So they take an active role in mixing people up. They take an active role in identifying people that can take on other roles within the um, organization. Um, so even in that picture there, there's Farhad, who's an Afghan uh, refugee, Harry Fairchild, who is um, a Down syndrome, the first Down syndrome coach in the world for table tennis. And, yeah, and it's about actively identifying their skill sets and giving them the opportunity to do it, but then making them mix up who they coach and how they coach. And it's also about creating a safe space as well. They're lucky that they have their own um, clubhouse in Kemptown, but they actively put up, um, this is just before an event, but just behind there, there is um, a piece of graffiti that was done for the Hummingbird Project, which is actually, refuge, says refugees welcome. Uh, they put up the different uh, national flags of people that come in, so one particular, um, young person who comes in, uh, first time, clearly quite shy, and they say, where are you from? Oh, Sudan. Okay, we'll put up a Sudanese flag for you. And that makes them feel at home. So instantly, from the moment they walk through the door, they're welcome, they said hello, you're, you're made to feel that you're part of this space. And again, it's this active role that the, the, the coaches take. So I'm going to move on to a slightly different project. This was one I did with through the British Academy, working around the idea of just this came immediately after uh, the jungle and thinking about how the role football can play. And partly with that um, image of, of the jungle in mind. And again, it comes back to this idea that maybe we shouldn't be doing these big projects that oh, you know, will get people playing football and this will be great. Lots of grassroots organisations have done things like this. You know, not just about football, but it can be you know, cooking classes or English language or, or other types of leisure activities. But what it does is actually just bring it down to the mundane, the everyday. Is particularly in a camp, kicking a football around may seem quite trivial, but that's actually quite nice. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite mindful. It switches your brain off from the travails that's going on. So it's not just physical activity, it's good for mental health. It's good in some cases being aware of, I don't want to use the same old uh, sort of narrative around uh, trauma around this group of uh, people, but it can also help trauma, and particularly if one has organised activities. Because in a life, in a world where actually that's characterised by time just blurring, particularly in camps, but particularly when going through the asylum process when one arrives in, Bro in Britain, having your everyday Tuesday and Thursday football activities or table tennis activities or cooking activities gives you structure in your life. It's like we can come and we can just, we know where we stand, where we sit in the week. And to a certain extent, it's sociable. Who doesn't like doing their own activities that they like to do? And just being around people is actually quite positive. And also, to a certain extent, being one of the team. Now, I don't I hate using the word banter in relation to football, um, but actually having someone making fun of you because you've missed an open goal, you're one of the team, you're normal, you're not someone, and it comes back to the idea about identity. You're no longer a refugee, you identify as a footballer or a table tennis player. And that, that actually can be very, very beneficial in the long run. And finally, to sort of bring it full circle, how can we bring this back into advocacy? It's a bit, it's a bit after the horse has bolted this one because this the campaign was two weeks ago. Um, but this has been going for three years now. Football Welcomes Refugees, which has been run by someone called Naomi Westland at Amnesty International. And this was an idea that came out of, okay, how do we positively say about what football does? And rather than some of the more traditional anti-discrimination campaigns that exist in sport, football in particular, which is usually criticizing clubs for not doing enough, this was much more about celebrating what clubs are already doing. Because in a lot of cases, some football clubs are doing community work, they're doing things under the radar without necessarily people knowing um, what they're doing, and just saying, oh, okay, you, you're welcoming refugees for a free game of football, or your, you know, your community club, your community activities are bringing people in and just showcasing. And then out of that has come a network where people putting on these types of activities come together. There's um, a good example of a coach at Notts County who was going, I thought I was the only one doing this. And actually learning best practice and learning ideas about how to keep this going is, is one of those things. It's very everyday, very mundane, quite banal, but actually it's really important in the long, in the grand scheme of things. So thanks very much. Fantastic.
fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, yeah, we had a great afternoon a couple of weekends ago at Lewis Football Club, which was one of the clubs that signed up uh, to that. And it was, uh, yeah, it was my first ever football match and what a nice way to, to go. Brighton didn't sign up, so more work to do. <laughs> so if I can invite all of all four of you to come and sit at the front and then we'll start the uh, start some discussions. Um, I mean, it's we've been all around the world now with this uh, uh, this work, um, but I want to just um, ask Laura first of all if you would, um, from a sort of voices in exile and perhaps with your um, advocate's hat on, working hard. Um, if you would just give us some uh, some reflections on 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 how voices in exile has been working with researchers, because I know there's been some interaction, but also if you have any reflections on how the sort of scale and scope of this kind of work speaks to the sort of needs of, of organisations like Voices. Okay. Um, first of all, just to say apologies from Mel, who's the director of Voices in Exile. She couldn't come tonight because she's had a bereavement, so I'm sort of stepped in at the last minute. Um, so apologies that you haven't got her and your <coughs> mum and me, but hopefully I can um, relay some of the things that she wanted to say um, this evening. Um, also, I just want to say that Andrew Wingate is here from Voices as well, if you want to wave, <laughs> is a trustee as well. He's been a trustee for quite a long time, so maybe he can help answer some questions as well if there's anything about Voices in Exile. Um, maybe just to say something about Voices in Exile and what it is, because I don't know if everybody knows. Um, it used to be called Brighton Voices in Exile, but the, the remit has kind of grown and it um, the charity supports people across different parts of Sussex now. Um, it basically supports refugees, asylum seekers and vulnerable <coughs> migrants with no recourse to public funds. Um, it provides an immigration advice service which is really important because there's very little free immigration advice available locally. Um, it, it has a food and toiletries bank, um, a mentoring service for refugees, um, group working activities, and it manages the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Programme um, on behalf of the City Council. Um, so that's quite a big part of its, its role now. Um, so it's, it's pretty locally based. It's, it's working with refugees in the local area to support them. Um, so, and it's really quite a major local charity. Um, and for that reason, we get quite a lot of people contacting, wanting to do research. Um, and sometimes academics, sometimes research companies, sometimes quite often students. Um, and some of them are very well thought through. They send proposals, they send their methodology, the participant information sheets, um, and give a very clear idea of what their ethical policy is, and so on. But a lot of them don't. And um, it was quite interesting because Mel sent me a bunch of emails from people contacting to ask to do research, and it, it was it was it was quite amazing. I mean, some of them were from students. Um, and they really expected just to be able to come in that week and talk to people, you know, without really any preparation. I, I don't know how that happens because, you know, from my experience of working in a university, you have to go through quite rigorous ethical procedures. And I don't know why they've missed that. <laughs> Maybe they've been badly advised or I don't, I don't really know. Um, but there seems to be a kind of a lack of awareness of you know, how overstretched some of these charities like Voices really, really are and how people don't really have a lot of time to, to, to respond to these kind of um, requests. So if people are contacting Voices, they need to be very clear um, about, you know, what they want to do and what the time frame is and, um, you know, how they're going to protect people's confidentiality, their anonymity, um, how they're going to you know, consider their safety and their well-being and, and what they're going to really give back to the charity or to the, the wider, um, you know, sector. Um, you know, and just think through some of these, these practical issues as well, like um, um, practical arrangements around reimbursement for travel and time of, you know, people who are going to take part in the research. Um, 
There's been a couple of, well, a few um, requests from people wanting to do like film photography without really much thought about the confidentiality aspect and how they're going to manage that. Um, and really, I think the charity would like to see, you know, what sort of questions are you going to ask and how are you going to keep it focused? Because there have been some um, incidences of people kind of overreaching their remit of, and there's a, there's a concern, I think, from um, practitioners, you know, um, people working in organisations like Voices that some of the questioning might might trigger like trauma it might you know it, it might upset people um, it might bring up a whole can of worms um, and I think Mark touched on that he said about um, I think you said something about that didn't you about you know um, bringing up these kind of issues and um, it, it, it's obviously it's it's, sometimes it can't be avoided um, if that's the, the maybe the nature of the research but sometimes it, maybe it's about say about education or something or you know it's, it's not about their life story so you know it's to be clear with people don't keep you know asking people to retell their stories if it's not relevant to what your research is about um, so I think there are there are some tensions between obviously you know as, as everybody said you know there's 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 quite a, a blurring of the lines between advocacy and and research and and that's and that's good to some extent because you know we're getting away from this idea of a researcher coming in and looking down at the research you know it's it, it's not really like that anymore you know people are much more um, you know they are activists they are researchers and people are in, in the, the lines are blurred um, but you know we also have to, to, to think through the the issues of the you know the ethical issues and be very be very clear about that as well um, yeah so um, I mean there have been, there've been people like, there's been some, um, I said, I mentioned there was a student who wanted to come in like that week and um, Mel's response was, oh, I, I can't do this week. I could maybe do like six weeks time. I've got a slot, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and she was like, well, my deadline's in five days time. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you know, and then asking very kind of, um, and then asked a, a, a bunch of questions. Can you just reply to these questions? You know, and, but they were very like big questions uh, that would take a lot of time to reply to. And and she's like, mm, sorry, no, I can't do it. Um, so you know, there's that kind of thing that that happens quite a lot. And, and people contacting without doing a little bit of online research and finding out what is the charity, what does the charity actually do. And just asking, like, what you know, what is, what are your aims and objectives, rather than kind of looking, doing a bit of online research, finding out a little bit about the charity. For example, there was one person who contacted, who wanted to access people in detention centres, you know, and um, you know, the director said, well, we don't work with people in detention, you know, so we can't help, you know. So, you know, there's a bit of a lack of preparation um, quite often. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Do you want me to say something about the? Uh, just, uh, I mean, it was fascinating to, to hear the the, um, the presentations today. Obviously, you've got two sort of international research projects, um, which for for an organisation like Voices may be kind of less directly relevant the research but I mean obviously there's other charities that they'll be more relevant to and obviously political campaigning um, um, but I'm just thinking you know maybe for, for say volunteers working for, for an organisation like um, Voices that do mentoring you know it, it's it, maybe it would be good for them to know more about the situation of where people are coming from you know from the camps from Lebanon or from Jordan or from you know they've been maybe some of them come from um, you know the camps in, in Calais and you know so how, how could could that um, you know research be relayed to people who are working with the you know, with um, you know refugees here, 
so that they get you know that bigger picture because if you're working with refugees say they, they might you know I know people who've spent several years in in the camps in Lebanon for example um, and you know they've had children there it was a big part of their lives and we kind of forget about it a little bit because we think oh they've come from Syria they've come here and we kind of forget about a massive part of their lives you know where they're you know they're the people I'm thinking of are quite early 20s you know they've spent several years there they've had you know a baby there it's like it's a massive part of their life and but as I was saying you know you don't really want to be asking people about that because they've had to tell these stories and you don't want them to have to you know it's not really my business to ask them all about this but to get um, a better understanding of where they've come from would maybe help people to you know um, to know how to relate to them um, and and also how, how does how do these um, how does this research about um, about pressures on cities for example in in places like Lebanon how can that be relate to the pressures I know it's kind of minimal in comparison you can't really compare it but there, there is a sense of pressure here uh, in Brighton even though we've got quite a you know very small number of people um, but there's a there's a perception of pressure because um, we've got a housing issue for example so how could how could that learning be translated into the learning for our refugee population um, I think for me um, it's really important to I mean I'm, I'm really interested in co-produced research and um, in terms of taking how do you how do you get you how do you um, take the implications from your research and and bring them into into reality and into practice you know how do you do that and I think a, a, a big way of doing that or a, you know a really important way of doing that is through thinking about co-production and how you involve um, the people that you're working with you know how you, rather than just researching them how do you involve them from the beginning you know or as much as you can in this whole um, process of research and Marx you know was talking about you know the people at the table tennis club and people you know seem to have been very involved in this whole in this whole process and but sometimes that doesn't happen and then you know the research does the research and then you know does an amazing report that nobody reads I've done it myself you know I've written reports nobody's read them um, or maybe one or two <laughs> you know but um, you know I think we need to think more I know it's kind of like the inward co-production but you know we need to think more how can we involve people from the beginning in thinking about what do we want to research you know what do they want us to research what are they in interested in and how can we do it how can we get people on board you know from organizations like you know like Voice in Exile or other organizations working with refugees how can we you know I've done it I've you know I've worked in projects myself where we've had people from different organizations I worked on a, a project years ago about um, barriers to education for refugees mm -hmm. and we have people from different refugee organizations and just asking them you know how can we do this in, a, in, a, in an ethical way you know how can we access people what sort of questions should we be asking you know so I think that's a really important way to bring the two worlds together and make an impact because if people are involved and they've got a sense of ownership over the whole process and they can also you know help inform about issues around you know ethics and how to try and avoid this these you know these issues of you know maybe upsetting people causing distress um, which is something that a lot of practitioners worry about um, so yeah I think I think I've said enough <laughs> I'll stop now <laughs> yeah so lots of um, ethical and sort of practical logistical issues that I'm sure are not just relevant to, to voice in exile but also to, to all kinds of different um, activist groups that, that uh, 
academics might want to work with. So sort of picking up your last point, I wonder if I can ask our other resident academics, to what extent was your work kind of informed by um, engagement with activist groups and how did that engagement go? In some cases you were, you know, the activists, in other cases maybe you were engaging with them. So any reflections on that before we open it up for some more questions? Shall I start as I've got the microphone? Um, I think, as Jodie alluded to earlier, the, the boundaries are very, very um, fluid, I think, between uh, activism and academia. The question is, am I an academic activist or an activist academic, I suppose? Um, and I, this is one of those part of that, the ethics and thought process is how do I balance my academia yeah, with the activism? Because um, I, I wear several hats. One is um, I was one of the early um, committee members for Sanctuary on the Sea in Brighton, um, and I'm now a trustee with Hummingbird as well. So I was volunteering with them as well as being a campaigner for Hummingbird for Sanctuary within Brighton. Uh, to a certain extent, that's what opened my eyes to a lot of the questions that I thought would be really interesting as a, an academic, which is then why I suddenly reflected on myself to go. Um, Am I just using these people? Am I just thinking, oh, this is good for my career? I can write a, a journal article, and then I, and then that works for my career. But then, actually, am I helping people? And then that's when it comes back to working with those organisations on the ground. Where you go, okay, the the research should be going back. So that sort of gave me the credibility then to be able to work with the table tennis club um, and other sort of grassroots organisations around the country to make sure that they trusted what I was saying. Um, but then the, where the research, I think it's through to the people that actually need it. But then you know, am I coming from a particular point of view, which is, well, I care about this situation, I want to make it better, and therefore am I still an academic? But then what we do have is we should have robust ethical procedures, we should have robust uh, methods, we should have um, robust analysis, so we should be falling back on those skills where we can go, okay, we may be coming from a particular political position and I've written that you know, every position is political, so very rarely do you get challenged for your, um, for the, your arguments, your analyses, um, if it agrees with what the government wants. It's only when you challenge the government or the states or the political powers that you suddenly have a political position. Well, every position is political. So therefore, as long as I can fall back on rigorous academia, methods, yeah, ethics, um, analysis, then you know, that's the best way we can go forward. So I think it's just working, being involved in those groups allows you to work with them quite well and get it back to the people that need it. Yeah. Um, well, I think in my case, I was in a very privileged position because, as I said before, I started volunteering um, and then I became a researcher. And therefore, that opened up um, a whole series of privileged positions because uh, my informants were my friends and I had their trust because I had shared with them um, car journeys and uh, um, hostel rooms. So there was, it was a particular kind of research that I conducted and my background is in anthropology so I had to do, um, it wasn't too crazy to do um, a, a form of activist and engaged anthropology. Um, yeah. Um, and I mean, throughout all of that, I think for me, the difficulty was to be a researcher rather than a volunteer. So, you know, I had to step out of that, of my position that I had before and become a researcher, which is something that is quite, you know, complex to do, but it's, it's doable. And, um, and I feel like I, I was able to do it and share it back with uh, the volunteers. And also, um, I, took the precaution of uh, anonymizing um, the Hummingbird project at the time because I wasn't really sure 
how um, groups in the jungle were going to be um, treated uh, by the government. But I think that now that it's been nearly three years that the jungle um, has been dismantled, it's okay to come out and say that I was working and researching the Hummingbird Project. Uh, thank you. Just to add on to some of the points that you've already raised, I think there's particularly f for students of international development, there's a, there's a growing number of sound methodologies that we actually learn from elsewhere that we can bring to the UK and uh, for better and more ethical uh, and more bottom-up, if you like, engagement with refugee communities, uh, asylum seekers and other vulnerable groups. Um, so just an example, perhaps one of the things that we were conducting in our, uh, in our research on on the topic of well-being, such a broad topic, sort of, uh, and something that probably, if I ask sort of three or four of you, you all might be answering quite differently, sort of what it constitutes for you. What, it, what does it mean to live well for you, where you are in Lewis, in Brighton, uh, somewhere nearby? Um, you may give very different answers. Um, the way in which we went about raising these questions was, and this is, I think, there's a fundamental sort of um, commitment from researchers needed in terms of listening and having an open mind and also sort of stepping back from their expert knowledges and their expert power because you come in often into a setting as a privileged, well-paid or relatively well-paid, um, if you like, sort of, you know, Western academic um, flying in, flying out sort of within a couple of days and there's tremendous sort of uh, power differences there. But, but being, uh, in, uh, in my experience, is being humble and starting off with questions which are actually quite open, very open, and ask people very, very simple. So what does it mean for you to live well in this particular neighborhood here in inner Beirut? Tell me about it. And, you know, who do you think are doing well in this place and who are actually not doing so well? If you ask those very broad, uh, open questions, actually, you come, you start sort of hearing sort of the issues that matter to people themselves rather than coming in with, with preconceived notions. Now, you can use it as a fantastic starting point to then develop sort of other research methods, uh, qualitative or quantitative, whatever way you like, and, but also f coming back to communities with findings, interim findings, say, look, you know, this is what we're seeing. Does this ring a bell to you? Does it, you know, do you, you know, what do you make of this? Are we on the right track? So developing sort of enduring relationships with uh, respondents where we can is, is a really good way. Um, another sort of example, perhaps from, from international development, which I think is, could actually be quite pertinent to the situation here in the UK as well. It's, there's now a, a global movement called Slum Dwellers International, started in India um, you know, by a, a visionary leader uh, w with whom we have the fortune of working with, um, working with people living in informal settlements at risk of evictions, of being expelled from, from, from these areas. These people started self-organizing and actually started self-enumerating. So recognizing that governments may not have data on you, they don't know what's going on. Let's sort of start counting ourselves. We're going to provide you as governments with the data about our condition. And then we actually have the facts and we feel like we can talk, we can, we can talk about that. And then sort of the politics get charged with evidence. Um, and, and those methodologies are now being rolled out sort of across the world uh, in many, many cities. Uh, and are really powerful in terms of challenging decision makers. Um, uh, so another example, I mean, we've recently started um, in, in, uh, in Kent, working with the, the Kent Refugee Action Network. And, and one of the questions that we're interested in is sort of how do uh, refugee and asylum sort of seekers that are here and navigate sort of these, these urban spaces, if you like, how do they sort of operate in, in public space? And one of the questions here is sort of, you know, with who are the, the groups or actors that are policing them, that are monitoring them, that, that may facilitate or actually make it harder to engage or to use public space for whatever purpose they like. We s developed a little methodology where, first of all, as academics, we went around the table and said, like, what do we think? Who are these groups? Now, the next step in this methodology is actually go work with, with CRAN and sort of displaced populations, the youth forum they've set up um, in the coming month. We go back and say, look, this is broadly the exercise that we conducted, but we'd be really interested in hearing sort of how you, uh, what kind of answers you're finding using this particular methodology. 
And then afterwards, we sit together and say, right, let's compare some notes here, because we're quite acutely aware that we may have some, some pretty big blind spots that we, we, we're not recognizing. So again, it's an example. We need to sort of have an exchange of, of knowledges, of lived experiences, the everyday, the mundane, as compared to perhaps sort of, you know, the, the knowledge is coming from reading journal articles, uh, having a, perhaps a, you know, a few years of expertise on these matters. So. Yeah, fantastic. So some real kind of um, yeah ideas about falling back on on strong methods and, and ethics processes that allow us to engage engage well. Um, and I was hearing also about feeding back to participants and this idea of co-producing and not just sort of extracting knowledge and, and ideas and, and, and making it a, more of a two-way process and really listening and, and witnessing um, people's lives. Um, so yeah, there's obviously some, some good practices that we can, we can all be using. Um, so I'm sure that people in the audience might have uh, questions about the research uh, and also um, comments and insights. You know, everybody here is either an academic or an activist or both. Um, so I'm going to open it first to the room um, to take a few questions or comments. Um, and then uh, I think we have possibly some online as well in the next round. So um, anybody want to um, contribute? Andrew. Well, just one or two uh, random comments. I really want to compliment the Table Tennis Club. I had a group over from Sweden, um, Muslims and Christians, involved in um, asylum and asylum support, coming from all over the place, including Gaza. Um, and we spent a week in, Bright in, in Lewis and Brighton. And the thing that impressed them most, I have to say, and these were pro professionals working in this field, or um, Muslims whom they were supporting, was the Table Tennis Club. We had a wonderful evening there. And I can't, I'll never forget it. Um, me playing table tennis with this woman from Gaza, who, um, <laughs> and who has um, th three children, and uh, who then invited me, could, could I go to Gaza? And I said, I don't think I want to go to Gaza, it's not safe. And she said, well, you can go, I can't. And some of these informal comments really struck me. Um, and it came out of table tennis. So I do want to, uh, small is beautiful, and I, and I think it's one of the best things I've seen. Secondly, um, I, I'm from the church. <laughs> And one of the problems about talking about voices is everyone wants to volunteer, but they have no idea what it means. And when you say, oh, they've got to do a training course um, and you can't be just um, having goodwill, you've got to really prepare yourself. The numbers drop significantly. But what we need most of all is money, actually. Um, and that, uh, a thing like voice is, is strapped for funds. And if I, I say to them, please, that's the key thing. Not your um, goodwill, but actually your money. Because we, we hardly can employ the people we, can we, Laura? Hardly employ the people that we can. Um, the third thing is, uh, I've just come back from Tanzania, where my son, Matthew works for something called International Rescue Committee. Have you heard of it? International Rescue Committee. David Miliband. David Miliband. He was working for many years with Save the Children, and now he's the country director for Tanzania. And it is astonishing just to listen to him and puts our situation in 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 proportion. He has three hundred and sixty thousand refugees in his camps, and when I say his, I mean he has 200 workers, 360,000 internal refugees from Congo and um, Burundi and various places, and somehow they're trying to, taking your point about the city, <laughs> help them in the camps because Tanzania won't let them come out of the camps, but won't send them back either. They're living in limbo. I think it's astonishing. 
And um, uh, we need to listen to the international dimensions. That's what's very helpful from the two of you, I think, for me, anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. I wanted to ask Elisa something. Um, I was just really interested in what you were saying about a project that starts off as a humanitarian aid project and recognizes the need to have a political dimension. And I, I know we've, we've had Elaine come and talk to us and she articulates that very, very clearly. Um, and I suppose what I was thinking about while you were talking is how that makes the politics different, how you do politics differently if you come at it through that kind of humanitarian aid base. And then I was thinking about what you, what you were saying about co-production and wondering if you can kind of co-produce radical politics in the same way as you can co-produce research. Something around, sorry, it's not very clear, but that's what I was thinking about. Very interested in your comments. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, my question is from the point of view of a PhD student at Sussex who's thinking about their research and what happens when you get to the end of the research and you want to disseminate your research findings and you do want to do something more than just write a thesis and, and publish in a few journals. Um, and I'm a member of LOSDRAS and I've been working with refugees in Brazil and working here as well. And I'm really keen to think of creative, engaging ways to make my findings accessible. My participants in Brazil um, were wonderful, but it's very difficult to get back to, you know, go through my findings with them as much as I'm trying to do it remotely. So I'm trying to think, if you've got good examples of sort of, not necessarily best practice, but interesting ways where research was just given back. I mean, you talk about the, the, the Table Tennis Club and those sorts of projects that are ongoing, but other ways where research findings have been just made accessible and relevant for the communities who help produce them or who would really benefit from learning more about them. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, I had a question specifically uh, for Mark about kind of the leisure activities. Um, I'm looking a bit at kind of play CSR projects um, directed at refugees. And I'm kind of interested, I guess, in how discourses around uh, leisure and access to leisure and rights to leisure and rights to play intersect. And um, specifically, I get, guess, kind of the children to adolescent trajectory and how um, yet yeah, this creates kind of safe space, but how the barriers, how you navigate the barriers against that. question around interesting ways to feed back to participants so if anybody would like to take up any of those what shall I respond to the question um, thanks for the wonderful question I think um, the activism <laughs> that's <laughs> was that me Sorry, that was hello okay so the activism that stemmed out of Calais and specifically of the Hummingbird Project is um, very much issue-based. So there were some issues that needed to be addressed and there were very clear issues and those were brought back to the UK and dealt with um, through the activism and through also creating linkages with other organizations that were operating in the camp but were also based um, in the UK. I think also an important part of this activism is actually the strength of speaking to other people. So everyone who was involved in the camp came back to the UK or went back to their um, countries and started talking about it. And I think that created such a wave of um, consciousness and of activism um, that is very difficult to undermine. Um, also, Another aspect of the politics that came out of um, Calais is that it wasn't 
a kind of activism informed by ideals. It didn't start from an ideal and and then generated the activism. It was the other way around. So it was the practical engagement with the refugee crisis that created the activism. And that's why I think it's different from other organizations such as No Borders um, that starts from an idealistic point of view. I mean, you know, both of them are obviously legitimate, but I think in this specific case and in my research, this was very um, obvious. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, I was just having another thought on, on, the, on the same topic, and I was just wondering whether I could share that. Um, there seems to, your, your question was about sort of co-producing radical politics, and, and to my mind, part of that question is co-producing with whom? Uh, presumably, you are referring to the displaced populations, the refugees themselves. Of course, they're raising all kinds of ethical challenges, particularly where people's legal status is uh, undefined, unclear, uh, possibly sort of uh, uh, deemed illegal. Um, so, but there's, regardless of, of people's sort of legal status, there seems to me still there might be an ethical imperative to, to work with communities to see how they would like themselves, how they would prefer such politics to look, uh, to you know, co-defining, co-producing what it looks like before setting off uh, and uh, advocating and uh, politicizing these issues. Mm -hmm. And do you do you have any reflections on the the feeding back? Did did you take this video back to um, people in Lebanon? Have they seen it yet? They saw it immediately. Um, we put, so we. So what happened with this video is we worked, first of all, we trained the women themselves on how to shoot video and how to interview one another on these topics. So over a period of two days, they were sort of joined in interviewing one another. Then we went out and went to see some of the local authorities that you saw in the film. Uh, the, the elderly gentleman was a, a local government official um, who kept uh, saying, everybody's welcome, but um, now, after we produced the movie, and we, so we also went back, sort of, there was a lot of issue around translation, uh, the Arabic to the English, um, particular Arabic from the region. Um, so we needed sort of some toing and froing in terms of the translation, making sure we got it spot on, uh, that we were sort of misinterpreting or sort of wrongly translating what people were saying. Um, further to that, we organized a workshop at the end of the project with policymakers, and we invited the women to come and join us. Um, they had seen the video by then, um, and we invited them into sort of, we gave them sort of uh, an opportunity to talk about sort of their experience working with us through this process, <laughs> and they used this to lambast some of the people from some of the ministries in a fairly relentless manner. Um, so they, they, they certainly saw um, the platform fit to organize their own politics around. Um, so I think that's part and parcel of feeding back and um, sort of trying to sort of have sort of positive sort of iterations of uh, learning and perhaps activism. Great. Laura, do you have any? Um, yeah. Um, well, in terms of what, I think I've got this oh, thing here. <laughs> Is it not working? Oh, it's working. Okay. Um, yeah, in terms of what to do with your findings and how to um, <coughs> disseminate that to activist groups, um, I think maybe kind of some sort of knowledge exchange events, maybe where you invite people from the field, practitioners, activists, user groups, um, you know, that can be a good way to engage with people. So it's kind of like making those links, like as soon as you can, not wait until the end, but, you know, as you go along, trying to make those links with people. Um, because like I said before, like long reports, people tend not to read them who are, you know, apart from maybe academics, but people working in the field don't really have time to, to read long reports. But if there's maybe a summary, like one page, two pages, that might be, you know, what they'll look at, the key findings. Um, and then, you know, if they've got time, they might delve into a little bit of the report, but they're not gonna like sit down and read the report, you know. Um, yeah, I'm generalising, but I think that's probably true most of the time. Um, I mean, we've seen with, you know, with Dolph's film, the, f the films can be a really good way, but obviously that might not be, might be difficult with the, you know, it takes a lot of money to produce a film and it's not something that everybody can do. Um, but yeah, film, photography, can, you can make a presentation, Refugee Week or, um, 
there's different ways of getting getting things across to people that are better than a long report. Um, and yeah, just thinking, what are the key messages really? Just really, you know, what is the what is the main point of your research? What are the or you know, really get it down to the crux of the issue and what what do you really want people to to take away and just really focus on that um, you know and then how can that be translated into policy changes or um, practice and you know I think that's that's the main main thing really an agreement with that. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Um, I'll just sort of pick up on that a little bit about an idea um, and again it comes partly down to the type of things I have researched which has been sport and leisure so you've got a really nice easy focal point which is let's have a football tournament let's have a table tennis for tournament and then you've got something where there's some physical activity going on and I think out of the forms of leisure um, you know, one of the early things that St. John C did was did a video a documentary about women cooking you know it provides a nice easy focal point where you're actually getting people to have conversations and it comes back to Andrew's point which is about those conversations you have it's the mundane things and actually yeah we have a power dynamic we're talking to an audience which is very academic but actually when you're talking one-on-one -on -one with someone else and it could be over a cup of coffee it could be over a game of table tennis then some of this knowledge that we've amassed can filter out into a neat, much easier to digest format so that's why you know sometimes a football tournament can work that's why I've, that's why I've, I've worked out um, but it doesn't work for everything um, and that sort of comes back onto your question about leisure and the rights to play the right to leisure because this is a complicated one because the Declaration of Human Rights does have a right to free time um, but I th when it was written I think it's been pretty much argued that well that's in relation to work and having free time from work as opposed to leisure which is then a right to you know, going for a coffee morning or a right to play football or a right to, to access and I think when we talk about rights then it becomes very problematic in the contemporary world around who can access leisure activities and, and physical activities because they get increasingly privatized space gets privatized and what a sort of very good example of this was one from a project up in glasgow called united glasgow which is a football team now they set themselves up basically to, as a refugee football team so some local people went what can we do we play football um, and they started going to play football and then they started getting abuse from kids near the or young people near uh, the pitches where they played and they would go over and say you know what's the problem oh refugees are getting free things and it's like well we're not getting free things we're raising money for them to play on the pitches and that is through the conversation it was all the pitches in glasgow are controlled by the council and you have to pay to play on those pitches and those local kids didn't have the money to play on the pitches so they said oh, okay you can come in and join our team um, as long as you abide by our principles of anti-racism anti-homophobia etc um, but you know it, in some ways it became quite an inclusive space because of it because then they had different communities as opposed to being a refugee team but what you recognize then is it's who's controlling the space where those activities take uh, you know and there's, 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 there's other issues like economic about bus fares and transport and where are people housed compared to where the, the physical you know, the actual activities take place and when, and I think this is why it becomes problematic is when it starts talking about rights that's when governments don't want to because then they actually have to provide sport as a right or leisure as a right and they don't want to do that because it's going to cost money and I think that's yeah I think that's a long story to a long journey to take to push for that but it is in the human you know, dec you know the declaration of human rights so yeah okay. fantastic um gary do we have any any questions from yes. online <coughs> yeah this is from oluwato yin cole from um gainesville florida um, um, he said, um, what can attack the fundamental cause of refugee situation all over the world? Is it research projects or is it advoca ad advocacy at the highest level? Okay, and any more uh, comments or thoughts? This is probably the last round of, or, or questions from in the room. Any other reflections? 
massive questions. <laughs> Hi there. Um, my name's Lucy Bryson. I work for Brighton and Hove City Council. And I guess I just wanted to uh, make a plea or a plug to keep on keep talking to, the, to your local authorities, your local municipalities where you live because the research done both overseas and in cities can really, with, with, if used rightly with both officers and elected members, can, can, can have influence. Um, and I wanted to um, plug the fact that we did do, we carried out um, a needs assessment of international migrants in Brighton and Hove a couple of years ago, Mark knows about this as well, uh, involving some of our local NGOs and also doing some peer research uh, using methodologies developed by um, CUP at the University of Brighton. I just saw somebody instrumental in that who left a little bit earlier, unfortunately. Um, so uh, there you had the kind of triangle of uh, local migrant populations, the universities, the local municipalities and the community voluntary sector, which is a square, not a triangle, <laughs> all hopefully working together to produce a document. Um, this is the long version of it. Um, but we are, uh, and hopefully the local authority and the community and voluntary sector can hope are using the findings from this research, this needs assessment, to try and influence policy making on migration into the city. So uh, I guess it's just, uh, there hasn't been much talk about, um, uh, I suppose, local government and, and uh, local authorities here. So I've just sort of putting another, another bit into that picture, really. Thank you, Lucy. And any more? Yeah, I'm just going to say Thank you. Um, I just have a few comments and uh, one sort of question that's kind of for myself as well as all the other academics here as well. Uh, for Mark, um, I really agree to the everydayness of um, uh, sports as a means of finding everydayness. And I found this also in my own research when I talked to uh, other refugees that carrying a bag um, just to go and study Korean language was some kind of normacy they found that they're not uh, labeled as refugees or migrant workers anymore, but just a student, and how much that was uh, important to them. So it sort of resonated to what you just said. And to Laura, um, what you've mentioned about co-production and um, ownership is, is quite important. And I honestly have only <laughs> realized this after uh, working in the field of refugees uh, for a long time uh, before joining IDS as a PhD student two years ago when I first sort of began to study on participatory approaches to research and now I don't see how any other uh, way I could actually approach refugees when I carry on any kind of academic work, which is basically having them ask the questions, having them uh, identify the issues that they want to talk about, and then um, also helping them to find solutions or assisting the whole process. So um, I, I totally agree to what you were saying. And my final sort of question is, um, and I, I've had this question for a long time on how uh, all of you mentioned about the two different hats of being an academic or an advocate. Um, and if any of us here are identifying ourselves as academics at any point and are dealing with refugees or uh, migrants, um, is there any way we can actually do research without being an advocate? Like, is there any meaning of doing academia just for the sake of doing academia when it comes to um, addressing issues of, of refugees? So that's my final sort of question. Was there one more at the back as well? Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name's Tol Christie, and I am trying, at the, in the very early stages of trying to put together a refugee music theatre project. Um, I am <clears throat> I'm very new to this. I've never volunteered or done anything, so it's, it's kind of new ground for me. But I come from a theatre background, and I'm working with a, a, a several people, one of whom is likely to be, if she agrees to it, a... Um, 
a woman, a Syrian woman refugee, lives in Tunbridge. And what we need is to, without going into too much detail, we need to get some more source material. And I'm wondering if you can suggest any local organisations, such as all the things that you've mentioned, which would be a good place for us to start and somewhere where I could kind of, or her and I can tap into. And that's to anyone on the panel, anyone in the room. Thanks. quite a lot of, of issues to discuss. Um, so we had the, the first question that was around, um, essentially I suppose is, is research or practice intervention more important? Um, and later on something about how, how you wear those two hats if you, if you do. Um, and around making links to government, national and, and local, whether, whether anybody has, has done any work uh, with that. Um, and then Possibly that's a conversation for sort of among the room um, afterwards, but any sort of uh, issues that anyone can see with um, uh, sort of having refugees being uh, sources for, uh, I, yeah, I didn't quite understand the question, but if there were any links that people are aware of that uh, they should be aware of. Um, let's start with the big question first. Is it advocacy or um, practice? I think it's got to be everything. It's too big an issue not to take every possible means. Um, unfortunately, the global movement of people, well, unfortunately, there's always been a global movement of people. We're not a sedentary uh, race, the human race. Um, and, but with climate change, with increased um, sort of antagonisms between states, you know, wars don't seem to be stopping anytime soon. There's going to be a constant movement of people. So we have to have, use every means necessary. And so it almost comes back to a point, does it have to always be the top level that we go to? Because a colleague of mine who researches around, well, he's done research in Cuba and the Cuban, Cuban Revolution. He said that actually, despite what we might think about the current contemporary politics of Britain, you don't need half the population to sort of undertake a change. It's actually only about three and a half percent of the population who really advocate it um, and really drive that momentum. Um, why don't we be that three and a half percent? Um, why don't we be the people that, when we're confronted by someone's racist views or the, the negative views around refugees and asylum seekers, we're the ones that just go, that's not true. I think it comes back to Elisa's point about um, the, 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 the activism from practice is that you get to know people, they become your friends, you know their stories, and know why we don't want to steal their stories. Um, which comes back to an earlier point, there's a great ethics article called Stop Stealing Our Stories, which sort of links into sort of what Dolph was saying about um, letting them make the, do their own research and tell us what they, should, uh, they think we should hear. Um, but we can start saying, well, that's not true. You know, when people say, oh, they, you know, and I've had these conversations, they live the life of Riley. What, £37 pound a week? Do you live the life of Riley on that? And then you, you start challenging. And sometimes you're not going to change their views. But also it means that you're not the person who's being changed by their views to become, and you know, that, that, that tide of, of animosity gets stopped. So I think we, we all have a duty, or, and I think a right to sort of push back on that. And we can all do that. And it doesn't have to be some you know, monumental thing where we set up an, a, you know, a, a humanitarian organization. We can just be nice to people, um, which I hope we can all do. Um, and then there was the other point about, I was going to say something. Oh, the, the two hats bit. And I think it's interesting because this is more for the, for the academic audience than an academic one. But within Britain, there's a certain way of thinking about research, particularly to get government money for funding, which is you have to have impact. Um, and there's an impact agenda. And I think that's sort of why I come back to the ethics point, because one of the issues I've really had with some of my academic colleagues is that they can almost, they're quite career driven and they can spot out, oh, this is going to be a fundable area, or I can get um, publications out of this, and this particular area is very topical and, and they think they can have impact. And they never question their own privilege, which Elisa did really well about saying, well, actually, you know, I've got funding and I'm going to get a career, and actually, I'm just extracting people's stories for my own benefit. And actually, 
and th then they can tell their story they've had impact as well but actually if we're coming from an activist point of view which is where i came from i want to have impact i want to make someone's life better i want to help an organization like voices in exile or the table tennis club or sanctuary or uh, hummingbird but then am i that person who's just you know benefiting and i think it's about there's got to be a lot of personal reflection within that and it's almost to a certain extent when we work with certain organizations they, they're going to suss you out whether you are just coming in doing a couple of interviews and hoping to get a journal article out of it you know which voices can see quite quickly or whether there is something much more you know lo you know longer term and much more collaborative and there's a relationship being built where that information gets back and hopefully we can do the latter rather than the former and that's what makes us an activist rather than just an academic some easy questions at the end <laughs> Um, well, so to respond to the advocacy at the top level or research, I think as Mark said, it's, it's everything. It's, it's both and whoever can do research, please do research and whoever can do advocacy at the top level, please do advocacy and whoever is in the middle and everywhere just do whatever you can because i think this is really important and also just a reflection so i in my research i focused on calais um, which is a very localized um, research and a very um, specific case and what i started to realize is that in the case in, of europe there is a lack of unified advocacy. There is so many focal points where there's amazing advocacy. If you think about um, the Mediterranean, if you think about Greece, Calais, um, uh, Germany, but there is to me, there is a lack of unified voice that comes um, from the experiences of all these groups and these charities. And I think this is reflective of the difficulties worldwide um, to come up with uh, advocacy that um, can really impact um, our uh, politicians um, and so this is the first um, point the second point about being an academic and advocate is it a useful distinction and can you not be an advocate when you are in the field of refugee studies i agree with you i don't think that the distinction is necessary and you you I, i'm not sure how you can do it and i think that um, anthropology shows that very well um, and I think it's a very useful discipline um, that can uh, really be honest about its position um, in the field and the position that you would have as a researcher dealing with these issues. Thank you. So do you also want to mention the, your, the new network at this point after your reflections? Uh, yes, uh, it's a very good, uh, uh, good reminder. Um, on the first question, advocate, advocate or researcher, I fully agree with what both of you have said. I mean, I think it's a total missed opportunity for researchers not to speak and from very early on with people who are doing the everyday engagement on uh, for, uh, for different groups who are vulnerable. Um, researchers often operate from a distance, they have their own advantages, but they often don't know the everydayness and sort of the, the, the grind of going through programming, um, dealing with various kinds of authorities. Academics don't tend to have those insights. Now, on the other, on the other hand, of course, practitioners, if you like, or activists, they may lack the broader picture that sort of academics are, uh, are supposed to be good at and, and are, can be very good at. So bringing those two together, I think, is, is a really important sort of sweet spot where you know, um, grounded uh, information, evidence and perspectives from, from practitioners informs more academic research and likewise. And I think that conversation is absolutely essential. And there have been for far too long traditions um, of research where the researcher come in and look from the outside as if they're not part of the story. Um, um, so, but I think that is all changing quite rapidly. At least that's my hope. <laughs> 
Um, so the other question which came from the lady from the council, Brighton Hove, about local authorities, I think it's really, really important, um, particularly in, the, in this area. I think there's a greater global acknowledgement um, that um, sort of, you know, the grand bargain come out, coming out of the World Humanitarian Summit uh, in Istanbul in 2016 highlighted the key importance for humanitarians um, to actually much better understand local context. Uh, within cities, of course, uh, urban authorities, local governments have, have a really important role in understanding that. Um, of course, the international system for trying to tackle and addressing sort of global uh, displacement issues are all set up around nation states. And there's a real problem there because all the big global debates around the global compact for refugees or migration, they deal with nation states. And the, the cities don't, they're not a part of the, they're sitting, not sitting at the table, even though they have a much bigger role in the everyday uh, management, if you like, of the issues. So the global systems need to change. Um, now, at the same time, sort of, we are also seeing seeing um, in, in various countries movements where urban authorities actually actively challenge their national governments by not playing ball. Uh, this is happening in the, in the United States, for instance, around sanctuary. Uh, many cities sort of challenging sort of federal regulations um, that try to clamp down on uh, more, uh, well, try to clamp down on, on hospitality provision. Um, similarly, in the Netherlands, the, the local authorities actually say no to, to the national government when it comes up with plans which um, local authorities think are indecent. Um, so there's a real tension there between local authorities, and I think there's a growing recognition that we need to sort of do a lot more work with local authorities to work uh, to, to address these issues. But I think there's also another blind spot here, which I, um, which to my mind, it, should not be forgotten, and perhaps it's not quite as relevant um, in the UK, but in a context uh, like Lebanon, where sort of where my current research is undertaking, local authorities are not always just the municipalities. Um, you know, parts of southern Beirut are de facto governed by organizations that the UK government has recently banned as a prescribed organization, Hezbollah. Hezbollah rebuilds uh, after bombings by Israel 2006, rebuilds 15,000 houses. It provides welfare, welfare to its inhabitants, education, health services. We often don't hear about these, um, these kind of services and we often hear more about sort of the, the angle of its position on, on the state of Israel and its politics in the region. But if we want to be serious about addressing uh, yeah, supporting refugees, we cannot, in my opinion, sort of uh, turn a blind eye to uh, such areas which are actually hosting large, very large numbers of Syrian refugees. And I think there's a real problem then in, in, in sort of the, the politics of aid um, that sort of banning organizations is creating um, big blind spots. So local authorities aren't just um, municipal authorities, there are others as well. And I think it's really important for us to understand how they are involved in if, managing peaceful relations between refugees and host populations. Oh, sorry, I forgot about your point, sorry. Um, <laughs> right, quick pitch. One of the issues that we've been trying to undertake here um, as academics and, and where we also hope to involve um, much more um, people from the communities, community organizations, um, is to, to set up um, ongoing conversations. I mean, we like uh, being challenged by the questions that you raise. Um, we hope to keep working through uh, research activist connections. Uh, and in the coming period of time, sort of um, um, people from both the University of Brighton, uh, from Sussex, and here at IDS, um, we're setting up um, a series of talks, which are both, some of them are, will be more academic, others will be deliberately organized around bringing uh, community organizations uh, activist groups um, to talk, if you like, uh, with us uh, and to us um, so that we can have many more sort of uh, engagements. Uh, in June, July, we'll be having sort of uh, talks um, from uh, somebody from Lebanon um, and somebody who's uh, intricately involved in a uh, situation around um, the Rohingya uh, refugees in Bangladesh. Um, more talks will be organized and the dates are to be confirmed. Um, but. Um, this is just to, to bring this to your attention. Thank you. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, yeah. Just um, going back to the question about research and advocacy. Obviously, it's it's both. But just thinking about this term of refugee crisis that really <clears throat> seemed to come about with the Syrian 
um, you know, issue and all the people that were, were, you know, we saw coming out of Syria a few years ago. And um, I think, you know, obviously a lot of a lot of the, the so-called crisis is, is, is caused by war. And what can we do about that? I mean, obviously there's this peace campaign and, and that kind of thing, but I think a lot of the research and advocacy that he's done is, is not so much trying to stop the crisis as how can we adapt to the crisis? How can we try and minimize the suffering from the crisis? How can we try and, you know, build a more integrated society where there's not this division between the host community and the, and the people that have arrived? and looking at all these kind of issues. So, you know, both things are important, obviously the root of it, but also, but, you know, a lot of what <coughs> researchers and activists are doing is, is trying to respond to the situation that we're in, um, which is also important. Um, and, you know, in our current context, we've got this, this political situation where it's, it's very much a hostile environment. This is the policy situation that we're in. And, you know, how can we advocate against this kind of policy, these policies that, that, that we, we're faced with now? Um, and, you know, what can researchers do to, to highlight the, you know, the, the yeah, this, the, the effects of this hostile environment? That, that you know that people are facing now where they're destitute and um, you know really suffering because of our government's policies um, so I think this for, for me is what the crisis is now for our society here um, and you know what we need to researchers and activists need to kind of focus on um, I mean you're right to point out about the local government we, you know um, what can local government do? Um, but you know, obviously, we've, we've, we're, in, we're still in austerity. Really, we, we've got this. We've still got massive funding issues, and we're very limited in what local government can do because there's no money. And you know, there used to be a lot of research commissioned by local government. It's very little now. Um, and you know, coming back to the point about co-production, local government, and you know, often. And generally, there's, there's, there's not always that kind of, um, even just generally in qualitative research, there's not always that much attention given to it because, well, from my experience, they're, they're, they're quite often interested in numbers. You know, they want you to, like, um, do a questionnaire with, like, 500 people. And if there's not 500 people, it's not worth anything, you know. Um, they don't, they, there's not always the, 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 the proper recognition given to qualitative research, which is, is in depth trying to really understand people's experiences, the meanings of people's, you know, what is the meaning of, of what, what they're trying to tell you and um, what does that mean for us and our societies and what we can do in response. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, 